Greetings, ladies and gentle readers. I'm Dwyron, and I just finished all the skills to a deck building lit RPG by Honor Ray. And I have to say immediately, this is one of the most nervous reads that I've had this year. Uh, a couple of books that are coming out this year that really have me nervous to see, like, ooh, are they, are they gonna be okay? Are they not gonna be okay? Are they going to be terrible? Because I don't know if it was just me, maybe I've just been reading a lot more lately over the course of the past couple year. Yeah, over the, over the last year or so. Or maybe if there's something in the water and people should start getting tested. But there have been a lot of really, really bad books that I've come across lately, and it's made me a little afraid. Like, I... Like, if you know, if, if you've watched some of the other reviews on my channel, you know some of the ones that I might have been mentioning here. And unfortunately, this ticks all the boxes for the reasons why I'm nervous. Why I was nervous to actually read it, because first we have an unknown author. Check. And if you've been reading a long time, you find an author that you've never heard of before, the question is always going to be, will there be a book two? I am seriously looking at you, Dawn of Wonder, with the 18,000 reviews. Uh, they never got a book two. Yeah, I'm still salty about that. Thank you very much. So there's always a question with it, the great book one, fantastic, will they continue or will they vanish into the ether mysteriously? So ooh, that right there makes you a little bit nervous. Other thing that makes you a little bit nervous for good old number two, you look at the success of the first book, 5,000 reviews. Now, I don't know the analytics specifically on this, but I, I think from talking to a few other teeny tiny authors not sure if it scales why but for teeny tiny authors like the review system is like almost a hundred to one no not not that not that not not hundred to one it's more like uh 20 20 to one ish so I, I figure that his first copy is probably sold anywhere between 10 to 50,000 on the downside maybe close to a hundred thousand copies at this point I don't know but the problem is, lately, I've been seeing people who have been going crazy and getting really, really popular immediately with their first book, deciding, okay, 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 I need to really ratchet things up a bit because, like, I'm a somebody now, so I gotta do, uh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta really be somebody in my writing, and so they go and lean in weird directions that didn't make any sense from the first book. Because I guess they're trying to appeal to a wider audience now, or they're trying to go into a certain niche. A lot of authors that I've come across over the years have tried to, like, lean hard after getting some pretty good success for their first book into, like, the Game of Thrones kind of genre. So suddenly, out of nowhere, their characters are, are suddenly, like, dropping dead for no reason. Like, there's a whole bunch of, like, uh, kind of feeling uh, behind an unknown author suddenly getting famous with a good book. What happens on book two? Another one is how much time went into the first book. The first book may have been, like we had with Brandon Sanderson and The Way of Kings, I think it was like about 20 years that he like sat down and really was like thinking about how he wanted book one to go. But you're probably not going to spend that much time on book two, right? So the question is, how long has this person on a ray? How long have they been working on book one? Have they been working on it? 10, 15, a million years? How much time will they put into book two? Will it hold up to book one? There's just so many questions. So, did this one hold up? That is the question. Did it hold up? I think it did, for the most part. For the most part, I think all the skills, uh, book two, did, did pretty well. Did pretty well. For all the reasons I mentioned and more, the title is another one. Title's another one. Anytime like an author has like series book one, series book two with like the same names per book, just numbered differently, I kind of get a little nervous too. It's like, ooh, or, uh, it's like, why, why don't we have different titles for the books? Are we uh, just kind of shoving them out there? Please, dear God, say that's not it. Yeah, a lot of reasons to be really, really nervous. A lot of reasons, a lot of reasons. But overall, I think it did fairly well. It introduced some new characters. Those characters 
Okay, the characters seem to be their own characters, which I'm always a fan of. Definitely not hardcore leaning into suddenly being yes men to the main character and taking like a sharp turn into wish fulfillment or something. This book definitely did not go into the wish fulfillment route. There's a lot of things that go wrong. The main character has a couple of problems they have to go through, let's just say. I'll cover more of that in the spoiler section. Um, we learn a little bit more about the world, but not quite as much as I would have preferred. But we are getting like hints of what's going on in the world, like where the scourge is, like what the deal with the scourge is. Very small hints towards the end of the book on uh, what's going on there and how that relates to the world at large, how large the world even is. I don't remember in book one being told that there was like a bunch of other kingdoms in the world. This one definitely does mention that a little bit, just a little bit towards the end. So you can kind of slowly see they're building up to something larger, which is kind of interesting. There were a few teensy tiny things that I wasn't the happiest about. The ending of book one, if you've read it, you'll remember there was a significant thing that literally happened at the end of the book. And this one revolves a lot around the fallout from that and resolving the problems that arise from that so we can move past it to get on to other things in the world. Because you can tell in here the author has other things they want to do with the characters and not just be hung up on, yeah, this happened for the remainder of like whatever the series is going to be. I think if you did like the first book, you probably will like, I can't really think offhand anything glaring that'll be like, oh, if you like the first book because of this thing here, you're not going to like book number two. No way, no how. I, I don't really see that anywhere uh, in this book. I, I do think a couple of opportunities were kind of cut out because the author probably has a different way that they want to continue the book uh, than I thought they were going with. But that's just, a, that's just a little thing. I'll get into more details in the spoilers. But yeah, overall, I, I have to say it was enjoyable. If you like the first one, you'll probably like the second one. You might scratch your head a little bit at the ending. Because, like, a thing is going to happen. But then it immediately has no impact whatsoever. Because the tool to get a, around the thing that happens is instantly given to the main character. Which is a little bit weird. So I, I don't really know how that's going to continue. Uh, that's going to be a little weird. That's going to be a little bit weird. But aside from that, that little thing, that, that tiny little bump at the end, I, I, think it was, I think it was fun. It's a book that I, would, I read and I will read again. I think it was uh, enjoyable enough for a second read. So yeah. If you want to know more about the book, I will go into a deep dive right now. This is your last warning for spoilers. We are going to be talking a lot about the book right about now. So if you don't want to hear it, time to skedaddle. You're still here? You want to hear? Okay then. So yeah, the book begins essentially right at the end of the book one, where good old Art, good old Artie McArtface, has taken another legendary card from his cousin, essentially. But taken, I mean stolen. Sorry, I I was kind of glossed. He, yeah, he stole it. He stole it. He stole it. There's a bit of history there. You read book one. I don't have to go over that again. What's very interesting about that whole thing, though, is at the end of book one, we had an interesting peek into who the, character, the main character is kind of developing into. And it was one that looked at a bunch of people who were essentially just sentenced to die or have a really, really crappy life forever and ever having done nothing wrong, like the children of condemned people, like growing up in a penal colony where you cut yourself and you die. You, yeah, sorry, you got a cut on your finger, I guess they're dead now. Yeah, you're going to have like the Plague X-10 in there, and uh, you might want to just go ahead and kill yourself because you're screwed. And he's using the abilities that he's getting to help those other individuals who kind of have like a, kind of like a Robin Hood-esque character being developed from the end of book one. So I kind of thought that's what we were going to go into into book two as he starts getting accruing more wealth, as he starts getting more uh, cards, for example, that a lot of people don't even care about. They're like, ah, those are just a common card. They don't, they don't mean anything. I scratch my butt with them. It's like, okay, so we got a lot of wealth that we can he can accrue pretty easily 
that he can definitely give to people who he knows needs them. And there's like a whole bunch of villages like all over the place where there are these kids who are like growing up completely fracked, having absolutely no access to any of this, didn't do anything wrong. And they could do a thing. He, he could be helping them. What makes even more sense, though, is that wouldn't, that shouldn't even go over wrong, over badly with the barons that are, like, overseeing these places because it makes sense that if you're... The children, again, who done nothing wrong, even if they want to stay, and many of them do, want to stay with their families on these penal colonies, having them stronger just means more work, more... They're able to work more. And if they're not dying, then they can get more work done. So everything seems to be like uh, green lighting here for this like Robin-esque persona, Robin Hood-esque persona that we're slowly building up in book one to be helping the little dudes in these villages all around the borderlands. And of course, you would think, you know, he'd get into some some scraps with, or, or rub some uh, shoulders wrong with like the higher ups doing this. But overall, I mean, it should be, it should be a cool little tale. Not where we're going with this one, Sad, unfortunately. I thought it was. I thought maybe it was. Wasn't where we're going. That, that was the first little instant where I was like a little bit let down. So what does happen then? Well, he finds the egg, the legendary egg that was laid in uh, book one. Great. They tell everyone like, hey, great, legendary egg here. But there's badness around the egg. It turns out legendary eggs tend to kill people. Oops. So there's a big hubbub about like, oh my god, there's a thing here. Keep everyone away. Be very, very careful. Uh, introduce the egg to people very, very calmly. And only people who aren't most likely to die to it. So other legendary card holders, which are typically nobles, they get to obviously go first. I think there's probably the only ones that ever get to go anywhere near it. But good old Artie Art wants it for himself. He thinks that he is destined to be, have the egg. So he meets the competition for the egg. Scratch that. Before he meets the competition for the egg, um, he finds out that another egg, or another good old dragon that hatches, a rare, has the plague. And he's been tasked with uh, figuring some stuff out. And because of his unique abilities, he gets to store... He gets, he gets to help the dragon, let's just say. And long story short, he finds out where that bit of plague came from that probably infected good old dragon head. So he's put up as a little bit of a hero. This part here gets a little sketchy. He's put up as a little bit of a hero for having done that, but not really. He's very much in the shadows. Like a few people he knows, a few people know that he was there and he found out and he's the one who found out like where like the plaguey plague was coming from. And there's a few people that know that because of him, this rare dragon gets to continue living. But it is very kind of like hush hush, right? So, okay, cool. After that, time to meet the people who are competing for the good old dragon. Legendary, legendary egg. And wouldn't you know it, it his cousin's competing. Yeah, so we, we see him again. Now, obviously, that means no using the card around the cousin. Because he'll know you stole it from him. In the last book. Yeah, he'll know that, and that's going to go down badly. Also, since you're competing, you need, you need more skill. You need to be able to defend yourself. Prove that you are going to be a worthy warrior for this dragon. And he ain't got any. Now, this part, I think, is a little bit cheeky on the author's part, because we know from the first book, he's got a bunch of skills. He starts learning a bunch of, uh, a bunch of professions. And in one section of the book, he uses scissors. And I couldn't tell precisely if that was like a little bit of a wink and a nudge, a wink and a nod to Ethan from the Cradle series. Because like this unorthodox use of these crafting tools, it reminded me a lot about him a little bit. So I, I kind of wonder if Honoré is Red Cradle and we thought that was cute. So we added that in in like one little section here. For, like, this one little fight? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Either way, that was kind of cool. Unfortunately for him, the competition means dueling, and, again, that's where we see the use of the scissors and some other stuff. 
because they're competing to see who is presented to the dragon first. Cool. Pre cool. Cool. Great. Fantastic. He can't do anything, so he's... He has to be very, very creative in the use of his abilities, is all I will say, to not completely get his butt handed to him. Over the process of this, he meets the prince and a prince and princess of the kingdom, learn about their little abilities, they get in tight with him, and they become pretty friendly. In the course of the book, he winds up saving their life. Okay, he winds up saving their life. More on why I'm emphasizing that in a minute. Let's see, what else, what else, what else? Oh yeah, before the little uh, tournament bit, uh, the, the candidates are all taken to a scourge eruption to get a test of how they react under pressure. This is the first instance where I was a little bit let down. Because I think it was really interesting to put this person with a whole bunch of freaking skills in an area that is a disaster zone. It's a war zone. And so you got an area where you absolutely need a whole bunch of skills to make sure, like, everyone gets out alive, everyone gets patched up. Like, the whole shebang, right? So I think this was probably one instance where his weird collection of different things that he could do could kind of shine. We, we see a little bit of that when he steps into a tent, a medical tent, and helps a bunch of people. Like, that's pretty cool. But we kind of get yeeted out of there and into actual combat pretty fast. So I was a little bit let down we didn't do more like with, with that, but we're going a different direction. So we're moving along, moving along, moving along. Things go south really, really fast. And because he can store things, he winds up being able to save the lives of his team by storing them in his uh, personal storage. I forget if he... Yeah, he did get that in book one. He did get that book one. So yeah, he winds up saving the prince, the princess, and his cousin, who hates him, essentially, in his personal storage. Gets him out of there. A lot of the other candidates died. Like, entire teams of nobles with legendary cards completely wiped out. That sucks. But he saves them. Great. Now that one would be very hard to hide. That one would be very, very, very hard to hide. Because so far in this book, he found the source of the skirt, uh, the source of the plague in a city. He saved the life of a rare dragon that was succumbing to it by being able to, you know, put the put the brakes on that thing dying long enough for it to find a way to be healed. And then save the lives of three different nobles, two of which are of royal blood. So you think that people would be having a pretty decent opinion of this guy by now? Because he's got he's got a pretty good pretty good resume of things he's done pretty well for the kingdom. But all right, long story short, push forward again. Candidates in front of the dragon finally hatches. It's a bit of a dick. I won't spoil what happens there. It's just, the dragon's a bit of a dick. And he does really, really, really bad things. And the only way to stop the really, really bad dragon from doing really, really bad things is to reveal that he's got the two legendary cards to bribe the dragon into, you know, bonding with him. Which pissed off his cousin something awful because now he knows definitively that the dude that he's been hanging with uh, robbed his ass blind. <laughs> But great, he's now a legendary Deuterman. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, by the way. I'm not trying to spoil everything. But great, he's now a legendary Rider Deuterman. Fantastic. Time to meet the king. Ah, crap. Time to meet the king. And this is where we find a little bit of a road bump. So the king... It's a little bit crazy. He's, they say he's got dementia. He's bonded to a mythic dragon who does not have dementia. I appear that his the king trusts the ki the truth sayer that tells him whether someone's lying to him or not, and the mythic dragon. Those are like the two people that can t that we can tell that the king completely trusts. Unfortunately, the cousin is now um, petitioning for the main character's head to be on a pike, but and this is a huge but, huge 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 but. Everyone knows this is going to happen. The prince, the princess, they know. They know this is going to happen. The leadership from the other hive, where he showed the source of the plague, 
and saved a rare dragon. They know. But nobody speaks out in favor of the main character, which is uh, the first really, which is a really weird thing to do. Because you would think these people now have to know, oh yeah, he did. Oh yeah, the king ain't in his right mind. Everybody knows it. Uh, it's like the worst kept secret in the history of ever. And now there's Duterman who's going to be like petitioning for your brains to be like scattered across the walls. And they aren't there with the king petitioning him to for like leniency on the guy who's done like all these cool things. That's weird. Like even the prince, if despite what happens with the prince and him having his opinions, like you would think that he would at least come and, you know, talk on behalf of the dude who's about to be sentenced to death. Or the princess. Or the leadership. Right? It, it's it's a little strange. The only reason, unfortunately, you would have that that wouldn't happen is because the author unfortunately knows he's got another way out for the main character. But I definitely felt the absence of nobody speaking up on the main character's behalf, despite everything he did throughout the entire book. Like, no one was speaking up on his behalf. But yeah, suffice it to say, he's able to... Uh, I don't want to completely spoil the ending. Suffice it to say, he... During the course of him getting himself off the hook, he learns that the Scourge have these things called Scourge Gods. There are seven of them, and they're being kept in check by certain something that I won't tell you. And that fact is going to be important for book three. And for him to learn that, he had to be put in a certain place in a certain way. So he was going to learn that, which is why we didn't see people stepping up on his behalf. And it, 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 it just, it was just weird because it was like eh, a little bit, it feels like maybe the author was driving the ending like really, really hard in like a certain direction. But overall, uh, overall, I liked the book. I was also slightly disappointed uh, that the cousin realized that he did have the card because we have card stolen in book one, card revealed in book two. I feel like there's a lot that was kind of like uh, lost by doing that. Like, you could have, like, developed their friendship uh, and had, like, a more meaningful reveal, like, a book or two later. That could be kind of cool. During the reveal, Arthur's true parentage and uh, where he comes from is revealed. I think, I thought that was a little bit um, also rushed. I think that also could have been in, like, a book three or a book four because now you have, like, a legendary writer belonging to a house who he does not belong to who happens to have, who's literally on the border of the Scourge, right? So they've got skir they've got border villages, and he wants to help people on the border villages. So you could have had a thing here where the, uh, the reward for being a, like, a legendary dragon rider will go to this false family that he's now claiming to be a part of, maybe in exchange... For him being allowed to help more people along the border since that was his entire early life growing up. Like, I thought that was going to be more of a driving force for what the, char what the main character wants to do. So I felt like there was a lot of interaction that we could have had with the Kane family in uh, book three, for example. Or maybe even in this one. Where they have to negotiate not revealing that he is a complete freaking imposter in exchange for, in, in exchange for something. So I'll, I'll a little bit let down that that didn't occur. And I think it can't now because it's been revealed that he's not, he's, he's not, he's not that. So I, I, I don't like that that possibility has been broken. I feel like it could have been leaned on in future books. I don't, uh, the same, same thing with the cousin. I felt, I, I feel like it's kind of unfortunate that that path is being cut off because there could have been a bit more of a dramatic reveal later on, especially if they're going in the direction it looks like the book's going with the final revelations towards the end. But overall, the book was good. Overall, the book was good. Those are just a few, uh, those, those are just uh, the two uh, big little question marks that I had on, on on the thing where things could have gone differently and I was a little bit surprised they didn't. But overall, it was good. I enjoyed it. I recommend it completely if you like the first one, you like the second one. And I guess you like the third one. Apparently, I didn't even realize this, he's got a, a Patreon, I think I read at the end there. Don't quote me. I think I read that at the end. I think he's got a Patreon and a uh, Royal Road. Yeah, confirmed. He does have a Patreon and a Royal Road. I can see book three, chapter one is already up. 
chapter two is already out. I'm not going to read uh, those, by the way. I, I didn't read them before. I'm not going to read them now either because I like to wait until like all the editing's done and the thing's finished and I can, re and I can read it all, uh, all at once. But yeah, I enjoyed it. Hope you did too. Fully recommend it. Not going to lie. The only book that I'm uh, worrying about more than this one is the second book of Iron Prince. That's that's the one. That's the one that I'm deeply, deeply, deeply worried about now. That's I hope both of these, whenever they come out, whenever this one comes out, is also living up to the first one. But when that comes out, you can be sure I'll be reading that and reviewing it as well until I'm done with my next book. Happy reading, everyone, and I'll see you next time.